I always have to burp right when I start recording. Okay, fine. Um, hi, everybody. That is preserved for posterity. Uh, hello, my name is Joshua Schwartz. I am the spiritual leader of Beth Lita Forest Hill Synagogue, and welcome to the second uh, edition of our new class called Sphirota Omer, exploring the sphera of the week when we count the Omer. So each of the seven weeks of the Omer is associated with the seven lower Sphirot from Chesed all the way through Malchut. Last week we looked at Tiferet as a as a as a nexus, as a balancing point, the central pillar that balances right and left, that balances love and law, that balances kindness and judgment. So we looked at Tiferet as the synthesis of Chesed and Gevurah. This week we're going to do the opposite in a sense because we're going to look at one sphera that always comes along with another one. It's almost impossible to find uh, Kabbalistic and Musser texts that treat Netzach on its own. It's always the Netzach Hod industrial complex. Like you never see Netzach by itself effectively. Often you'll even see them as a triad, Netzach Hod and Yesod. So two good books to look at if you want to find some, I think, relatively accessible Kabbalistic material to look at in which it explores the uh, different aspects of the Sphero kind of one by one. One, which is more focused on, um, on Musser, right, on personal ethics, on self-development, on embodying and mimicking and modeling yourself after the Sphero, is a book called Tomer Devora by Moshe Cordovero, we mentioned before the recording. Moses Cordovero, who is a 16th century uh, Kabbalistic teacher in Sfat. And it starts with uh, focusing just on the sphere of Keter, but in the back half of the book, it goes through all the different spheres embodying it. And when he hits Netzach, it's actually Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. It's all three of those together, all three of the more practical or physically oriented, corporally oriented spherot. So that's one book, and it has more to do with what it means to embody those energies, to model yourself after them. Another book which is more theoretical, that treats each sphera as it appears with all of its different kinuyim, all of its different associated cognomens, the names of God associated with it, is called Sha'are Ora, which we've also learned together before, by Yosef Chikatili, a 13th century Kabbalistic writer who's associated with the circle, associated with the publishing of the Zohar. Um, but that treats it in a more theoretical level because it looks at every appearance in the Torah of the Sphira's associated names of God. So for this Sphira, um, it also comes along. It says, seventh and eighth Sphira together, Netzach and Hod. You never get them by yourselves. And interesting about Netzach and Hod, um, as we're going to think, I want to start by looking at the, uh, look, looking at the image of the Sphira. So one second... Bingo, bango. Great. Can everyone see that okay? Um, so, yeah, so here we have the seven lower Sphira. Um, so Netzach, Hod, and Yesod are the lower triad. Last week we talked about how each of the Sphira are organized in these threes, right? Three, 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 and then the one that balances with the rest of them, right? Malchut is the one that uh, faces them all as its own, standing as an equal. Um, so Netzach, Hod, and Yesod, right, left, middle, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, um, masculine, feminine, non-binary, um, right? Something in the middle that's not defined by masculine or feminine, synthesis of the two. Um, but interestingly, actually, so generally speaking, the right side is masculine and the left side is feminine. And that's true the whole way through. It's interesting, especially that the word for strength and power is actually associated with the feminine side. And maybe you, uh, in like Western conceptions of gender, maybe you'd expect these two things to be switched, right? Kindness, feminine, strength, masculine. But here, actually, it's the opposite. Um, so all of these are drawing from, right, the right side energy. Interestingly, with Netzach and Hod says, says these theories, actually, that they actually kind of swap energies. So Netzach is associated with Moshe Rabbeinu, Hod is associated with Aharon Cohen, and while Netzach is on the right side and Hod is on the left side, uniquely here, Netzach draws actually from the left energy, and Hod draws from the right energy. Because Hod and Chesed are, are related to each other. In a lot of Kabbalistic and Hasidic writing, 
The Kohen, right, Aaron the priest is associated with Hod, but the Kohen is also seen as an embodiment of Chesed. So the Hod is drawing the energy of Chesed, and Netzach is drawing the energy of Gvura. Um, which makes sense, because like Aharon Kohen is like a sweet, kind, humble person, and Moses, I mean Moses is also a humble person, but Moses is a, is a more bold, more forthright leader. Um, Netzach means victory, it means endurance, it means expansiveness. Right? One thing kind of you'll see, the right side is expansive, and the left side is containing. Right, the right side extends, the left side receives, can, uh, holds, nurtures. The right side explodes, the left side, um, the left side uh, synthesizes. Or since that's wrong, the left side mm, contains. So, and then we have the synthesis. So Netzach and Hod really come together. They're seen, you know, if you were to imagine this pasted on top of a human form, which the Kabbalists often do, right? Because God is compared to the, you know, the image of the likeness of the human being, as we see in Ezekiel 1 and 2. Um, these are associated with the kind of the intellectual faculties. These are associated with the, the trunk of your body. I said last week that Tiferet is associated with the solar plexus. Right? There's a lot of actually interesting uh, mappings of the spherot also onto like body work and chakras and things like that as well. Other traditions that look at energetic nodes. Um, Netzach and Hod are associated with the shokim, with the thighs, the legs, right? The 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 um, the part of us that stands on the ground, it's rooted in the ground. So that's what these are associated with, and they kind of come together, right? Whereas these are kind of chokma is the mind, bina is the heart. Right, Chesed uh, and Gevura, right, are each like uh, individuated aspect, and Netzach and Chod are two, one two one part of a two two bit system. All right, what, right leg, left leg, the legs come together. So, um, like uh, Adarava, right, the opposite of last week, Lehefech, where we looked at Tiferet and synthesized into it, we're actually going to go against the grain, and this week we're actually just going to focus on Netzach on its own. Um, so we're going to look at endurance. We're going to look at Netzach as victory, as struggle, and what that entails. And I think actually, especially given the conversation we were having before we started recording, I think especially a relevant theme given what I think a lot of us are going through right now in terms of COVID exhaustion, feeling bottomed out, feeling drained of energy and the like. What does it mean to really dig into the lowest, deepest, groundiest parts of ourselves and really pitch ourselves into the battle of what life entails. So this is going to be our most Musardic shir. Uh, for those of you who are fans of Eliyahu Dessler, Mikhtav um, Eliyahu, right, the kind of more Musardic, like yeshiva, Musar, like struggle. This is going to be like, I think, a lot of good texts and ideas and we can arm ourselves with what it means not to give in, but to dig in and fight. That's what we're going to be focusing on. Netzach, victory, enduring through it. So we can get we can get through this together. So let's look at uh, let's look at some text. Um, okay. Great. Can everyone see that? Okay. Okay. So. Here, <laughs> uh, here we have, um, so I want to start just by looking at some appearances of the word Netzach in the Tanakh first. And we might not even barely get to classically Kabbalistic literature. I think like just the Tanakh itself gives us a lot of really interesting things to look at. So I want to really like dig deep into this. So this is from Shmuel Aleph, the first Samuel. Um, and it is... Uh, part of part of more poetic part of it, you know, First Samuel. Part of it is the narrative of of uh, Shaul and of David and the like, uh, and then uh, part of it is David because he's you know the poet laureate of the Bible. Part of it is his more poetic contributions and the like. So, so the gam neitzach yisro lo yishaker velo yinachim ki lo adam hu lehinachim. Um. The endurance, the victory of Israel. This is, again, one of these cognomens of God, kinuyim of God. This is a way of referring to God. God is the victory or the endurance of Israel. The endurance of Israel does not lie. 
right? Does not deceive and does not recant. So the word yinachim here is a very interesting word. Um, what's the word nechama usually mean, right? Like think of Shabbos nachamu, like the first Shabbos after Tisha B'Av, linachem or nichum avelim, right? Comforting the mourner. So nichum or nachem usually means to comfort. But in this case, and actually interestingly, you see it earlier in uh, the book of Genesis referring to God's wanting to wipe out the people, the human population of earth because God repents or recants from wanting them to live, right? It seems like in the Tanakh, God's changing God's decision of like, yeah, I want earth to be inhabited by humans. Psych, never mind. And then decides to, um, to flood the earth. So that is an example of the word yinachem, to regret, to uh, renege. Right, so that's the way it's being used here. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting double usage. Um, unclear like what its relationship is to like the more comforting version of the verb, but here it means to to, re, to renege. So God does not lie, does not deceive, and does not renege. Ki lo adam hu, because God is not a human being who does do those things. Right, what does it mean to be a human being? It means to be fickle, to be capricious, right? To to change on a whim. Right? Who knows? You know, like you, you, you know, you're talking with somebody, and then like the next time you talk to them on the phone, they're like totally different, right? They're like can't access them. You don't know what's going on with them. You don't know. People change. People have all kinds of stuff going on in their lives. Uh, but God, uh, less the case, right? God is contains all. So you know, let's bracket the philosophical issue of like God being perfect and whether perfect entities can change. Da 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 da. But let's just kind of t tackle it more on a theological level. So when it says God is the Netzach of Israel does not lie, does not deceive, does not renege, not like a human being who changes. What, what do you take from that? Right, what, what kind of image of God is being projected here? Constant, steadfast. Mm-hmm. Great. Constancy, steadfastness, for sure. I mean, there's sort of referencing the eternal nature. But, uh, okay, great. Eternity. Very much associated with Netzach, for sure. Yeah, and I, in, in terms of, like, eternal, too, right? That, like, God not being a, a, an entity in time, right? An entity beyond time, right? Time is the agent of change. That's what, you know, that's what time is. Time is change over, right? Change over time, right? Delta D whatever. Um, so God, right, uh, existing at all moments at once. God is everything at the same time. So I think, you know, part of this is also capaciousness, right? God, if God exists at all moments at the same time, every aspect of God is constantly available, right? God is approachable in the way that you need God to be approachable because everything is available in God. Um, Okay, I think the lo yashak care language is very interesting. God does not lie, right? God, what, God is not a shakran, right? God is ms. This says it says in uh, you know chaysam elokim ms, right? That the seal of God is truth. Truth, I think, not as like something that is posited, per se, but you know the word ms or ne'emanus in Hebrew actually has to do with faithfulness, right? That God is there. God is not mispresenting or misrepresenting um, what it entails. Um, this is also, I want to I want to be clear, because I think this is actually very important vis-a-vis -vis the spheros. They're all true at the same time. And that's kind of the point of this, right? They're all true at the same time. This doesn't necessarily map to your experience, but it is a truth that is available when you can take it in when you can tune yourself into it. It's not always going to feel like God's not lying to you. Sometimes it feels like God did trick you. I did everything right. What else do you need from me? Right? That's, that's an authentic reaction to what you can go through in this life. But there's something undergirding it, says Natsach, right? That is beyond these changes of state. It's a God beyond experience, in a sense, beyond your experience, because it's a factical God. Right? It's a God that is a fact, not a God that's an argument or a God that's a position. It's a God that endures. Right? It's a God actually that, that no one can take away from you, no matter how hard they try. 
I think dignity is associated, a certain kind of dignity is associated with that. You know, netzach as endurance, and we'll look at hod next week as perdurance. Different aspects of what it means to have the, something that, that persists. But God is something that persists despite claims made against, right? Anything in which you try to make claims against God, God can absorb. Okay, I want to look at the Rashi on this, because Rashi is going to hone in on this issue. It says, He says, The im taimar, ashuv me avoni lefanav, I will do tshuva, right, for my sin before God. Lo yo il od litol esa malucha mimisha nisha nasna loy. Um, right, the issue here is David is interesting. You know, when, when I talk, when, when one talks about David and Melech, right, King David, what associations come to, come to your mind for King David? Dancing? Yeah, true, although that, that led to a certain ignomin ignominious end. But yes, dancing, playing music, right? Kind of rock star of the Bible. Fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, major lift. <laughs> yeah, I heard he played a secret chord. God's like, yeah! <laughs> um, yeah, uh, maybe the most romantic, one of the more romantic characters of the Bible, right, is the love stories of David are very passionate. David and Jacob are similar in that regard. Now, David, military, again, not associated with Netzach, but, hmm? Military success. Military success, right. Yeah, very much. He's the conqueror of Israel, which has its pluses and its minuses, right? Plus being that it facilitated the settlement of the land. Minus being... Famously, right, that he wasn't permitted to build the temple because his hands were dirtied with blood. Right? It had to be left for Shlomo, Melech Shaha Shalom Shalo, right? The king uh, to whom is proper peace. It had to be a peaceful king, a wise king, not a warrior king who builds a space for God to inhabit. I'll give you more. I don't know what the right word is, like sort of equitable as a king. Like he believed that everyone should worship God like in their way in celebratory ways and stuff like what what is what 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 brings that association for you? Well, because wasn't there something like he he wasn't royalty originally, like he was a peasant, mm. and so he still did things mm. the way he was brought up to do them, and then like whatever, like the royalty were like, No, no, no you can't do it like that anymore. And he's like yeah, I'm still going to do it this way. Everyone, <laughs> right? Way. I mean, there was yeah. I mean, there was by royalty. You mean there was king. There was King Saul, <laughs> right? Famously doomed King Saul. Um, I mean, like David as a person of um, yeah, from humble beginnings, right? A shepherd boy, a shepherd, a shepherd, a young shepherd, um, lifted up by by God. Although again, controversially, um, again, but da King David of deep relationships, right? He best friends, close, intimate friendship with Jonathan, Saul's son, which was a very complicated but very passionate relationship. Um, it's a very powerful scene where he takes off his armor before him in this really um, beautiful gesture of vulnerability, right? It's, that's like a warrior's vulnerability of like, you can stab me, right? You, I'm taking off my protective garments. I'm, you can, I mean, that, and that is, I mean, I've, also, I've always been very inspired by that image. That is what like vulnerability is exposure, right? It, to be close to someone means that they are close, right? Which means that it's equal parts merging, but also on the other hand, like that entails the risk of like, yeah, if you open yourself up to hurt someone, you're exposed, right? You, they, you, you let them in, you really let them in. Um, so the, David as a person of risk, I think is important here. David also, interestingly, this is what I want to circle around to, is um, a Balchuva, right? David makes a terrible, grievous error in terms of sending uh, Bathsheba's husband to his death in the army, right, to be able to get to her. And Nussan the prophet, right, it's actually how we start every uh, Tachnun, right, Nussan the prophet calls him to account for it. Um, 
So he is represented, I mean, you know, the rabbis will, like, on one hand, they'll see him as an exemplum of Balchuva, on the other hand, we'll try to say, ah, actually, maybe he, like, it wasn't actually bad in the first place. Um, but no, but David is, is the paradigm we have of being a Balchuva. So if you say, I will repent of my sin before him, right, I will, I will repent of my sin before God, it does not work to take the kingship away from the person it was given to. Aha! Now we get the point that while right, God doesn't welch, God promised the kingship. And I think this is actually something very powerful about resilience and endurance in relationships. What it means to have a bond between people, between person and God, is not that it is always on eggshells in which like if you, if you make a mistake, it's ruined, right? Because you had this precious thing. How could you then ruin it? You're my friend. You should know better than to say something like that. But rather, having a relationship is having space for the, and a, a resilient space for there to be varying levels of, of, of performance, of satisfaction, right? Of, of, of virtue even. Now, it's not a license to do any of those things, obviously. It's not, you, don't, you don't take advantage of a relationship to use that as an opportunity to hurt chas v'shalom. That's perverse. But rather, this is the point, just because you make a mistake doesn't mean, like, that's not the ruination of everything. So I will repent of my sin. Like, you know, I mean, think of it that way, right? It's like, if, if we were always worried, I mean, I think this is something that's actually sadly quite relevant for, I think, public discourse right now around accountability, is that you are disincentivized from taking responsibility for the things for the things that you do because of fearing uh, a strong or disproportionate reaction from people judgment without understanding right here what we have is a relationship girded in trust right grounded in trust that there is a benefit of the doubt that i make a mistake i am taking account i'm taking responsibility for it i'm going to own up to it i'm going to do chuva and that's not saying I'm, that's not you admitting corruption, or that's not you, um, that's not you undermining what it is. It's actually you exercising the power of that relationship. A relationship supports healing. A relationship supports tshuva. Otherwise, there's no such thing as solidarity. There's no such thing as strong connection. So I'm going to repent of my sin before you, that does not activate to take away this special quality, in this case, David's kingship, from the one who gave it to him. And who gave David the kingship? Who promised their heart to David? God. God, who is the eternal one of Israel. Back to Susie's point about eternality. What does eternality here mean? God's not going away. You might be scared that you ruined it. I sinned. I'm not living up to who I want to be. God's going to abandon me. No. God sticks with you precisely then. That's what endurance entails. To get through it despite appearances, right? Despite what on the surface seems like it would drive someone away. That's exactly when the, ru when the rubber of relationship hits the road of reality. It would, love would mean nothing if the point of it were undermined every time there was a mistake made. I think nowadays we, we, we start really on the other side of the equation in terms of suspicion. And again, there's no nothing in this that's saying that someone has a license to use a relationship as a way to hurt somebody, to make excuses for oneself. This is the opposite of this. This is to take responsibility for yourself in a genuine, doing real, authentic tshuva. And the point of the power of this endurance is that it survives you. The synthesis of you two together, you and Kaddish Baruch Hu, you and your neshama, you and the one that you care about, it survives you. It's stronger than one unit of it. Chut mishulash lo take. The threefold cord is not snapped. It's not severed. That's what it says in Kohelas.
We're stronger together. So it survives you. God is not abandoning you because you screwed up, because you're not there right now. God sustains you in those moments. God survives your mistake. God, you can't hurt God. We hurt ourselves. We hurt others. And we project that onto God. But God is the resource we draw on when we've gone to that, gone to that mistake. When we've gone to that place. Lo yishak er militein atova lezesha omer litein. God is not going to welch. God is not misper. Um, God does not deceive. God doesn't promise something. God doesn't fulfill. God doesn't lie by saying, "I'm going to take away the good." Okay, so that's Rashi's reading this principle back into the story of David. That David, as the paradigm of Balchuva, is is an example of what it means that kind of embodying our anxiety and our fear, right? If I admit what I believe to be true about me, right? This thing I don't want to admit is, are they going to go away? And the answer is, lo yishaker velo yinachem. Right? God does not, God doesn't promise something God doesn't fulfill, and God doesn't renege. God doesn't recant. Okay, so that's one side of Netzach. Excuse me. Sciences. So here we have Yirmiyahu, the doom and gloom uh, prophet of the Bible, uh, the dirge master himself. He says, Lama hayach evi netzach, umakasi anusha, ma'ana harafe hayo si ali, kmo achsav maim, lona emanu. Why must my pain be endless? So here we have netzach not describing God, <laughs> but modifying pain. A very surprising thing. Now, this isn't resolved, per se, right? Jeremiah really goes into the depths and the darkness. He says, why must my pain be endless? My wound, my wound enduring. Me'ana harafe hayosi eli you have been to me, God, you have been to me like a spring that is empty, that fails, like turning on the faucet and it sputters and doesn't, and doesn't flow. Ma'im lon emanu, unfaithful water, water that can't be relied on. That is a bold thing for a prophet to say about God. But again, a good, you know, I'm, I want to pose this as kind of the other side of Netzach. The one side of Netzach is endurance, right? The aspect of God or that's beyond the variations of our experiences that undergirds them all, that cannot be harmed by us, that persists despite us or in answer to us. <laughs> yes, she said a new insult and lot. <laughs> uh, so that's an aspect of God, right, that persists through us, beyond us, un undergirds us. Here we have Netzach that actually refers to the bounds of our experience. Like, it seems like my pain is an ending. God, how could you map to something so powerful as this? God, you're not reliable. God, you don't endure. Where are you? Right? Jeremiah is the poet laureate of exile. He's the traditionally ascribed author of, of Yecha, of Lamentations. Right? He sits, and he, he sits on the ash heap and makes poetry of pain. So, uh, yeah, a bold theological claim. And this is something that's very, I mean, like, it's, it's verses like these that we get things like the kinos from, or things like the slichos from, right? We get our, our liturgy of, of lamentation from. And I think something that's key about this is it's, a, you know, unlike the philosophical God of perfection and endurance, this is the phenomenological God. This is the experience, this is the experiencing of God that doesn't always map to what's true. It maps to what's true for you. It maps to what how it feels, right? And here it's like God, Jeremiah is like, "I'm I'm alone. Where are you? I turn on the faucet and I want the flowing water of your presence, and it's not there." I mean, fascinatingly, 
I mean, the word achzav is a fail is a fascinating word. Achzav. It means this like w hither and thither. Well, in context here, but like uh, kol adam kozev, right? Every person that we see that in when we say halal, every person fails you, right? Achzav is something that fails you. It's a very pungent lushan. So Rashi, in his more exegetical form, he says hayosia li. Ata havali kimo achzav. You are to me like, right? This the spring that is that is bottomed out. It's guttered. Ki adam she mivatcho mivtacho nifsak mimenu. Like someone who's trust, who's like um, what's a miftach? Like something. I mean, it's your trust, right? It's your it's your principle of trust, but it's also like the thing that you rely on. You are like it's like your your ride or die, right? Like your your last thing that you have that should always be with you. Your netzach, right? Isn't God supposed to be this miftach? That's exactly the image we just saw. And Yirmiyahu is saying like you are like my miftach that's gone now. My miftach that's nifsach. That ceased. That's disappeared. You left me. You abandoned me to suffer at their hands. Achzav. It's a spring that stops. Felis in old French. Apparently, that's my Duolingo has not caught up to that yet. Um, be quick, like uh, historical point. Luz here, be luz or loez, is refers to the Latinate component, um, the old la Francais ancienne, like old French. I mentioned this before. Rashi is a good source of old French, um, like linguists use it. Um, but interestingly, actually, in Yiddish linguistics, luz refers to the Latinate component of Yiddish. A good example of which is how do you say to say birkatama zone? How do you say great? What does it mean to say great, grace after meals? What language do you use to say that? A word? We bench. Bench. And what does bench come from? Benedicte. It comes from Benedictus. Very oh, good. Really? Yeah, that's wow. the that's the claim. Um, there's another one uh, that I'm not remembering right now. There is a lat, so there is a, a very small, but there is a Latinic component of Yiddish, which is taken through, like, you know, this is a good example of Rashi's dabbling in the vernacular, right? So, I mean, some people say, like, Rashi is, like, doing Yiddish here in the sense that he is um, synthesizing the vernacular language with Hebrew. Um, okay, so here what I want to say is that we have two oppositional poles of Netzach. Right? We have the philosophical Netzach of God that is the ground of all things that endures that is eternal right that is there despite the variegations of your experience despite your own personal failures god is there and here we have lahafach which netzach modifies pain it's it's that your experience seems to be the sum total of all there is how much it hurts how much it feels like you've been left alone you've been abandoned you've been left in their hands consigned to the dust heap. That we have both of these uses of the Lushan of Netzach is fascinating to me. But in a way, I want to claim that Netzach is actually, and that's what we're going to do, The even inside of Netzach, remember, every sphere encompasses every other sphere. Even inside of Netzach, I want to look for the synthesis. I want to look for the dialectic. Because we have the per, we have the endurance of Netzach, and we have the emptiness of Netzach. And I want to say that Netzach in truth, or Netzach in its fullest form, is in struggle. That's where Netzach is. It's a struggle unending. Maybe that's what I should have called this. I call it endurance everlasting. That's too, that's too bright. No, it's a struggle un and unending. Life is a struggle. Life is a struggle. Not in the sense that you're, I mean, you are at war, not in the sense that you are here to defeat others, but that there is a constant encounter with challenge. And the question we have, and again, this is, Netzach is not, Netzach is one sphere of the seven that we're dealing with. 
I want to say all of these are an energy we can tap into, a resource we can draw on. So I want to talk about it in its most pungent form. I am not agreeing, let's say, with a more fascistic sensibility in which it says that life is fundamentally agonism, right? Life is struggle. That is the definition of, of what existence is. I don't think that's true. But an aspect of life is struggle. There is struggle in life. And especially what we have been talking about just in our conversation between us, especially when the rubber hits the road, right? When the netzach hits the fan, we need to know what it is to draw on our resources, to keep on fighting. That's the musr, haskil, I want to focus on with netzach as it carries us through the rest of the sources. Netzach is endurance. I want to say it's in the midst of struggle. Because what does it mean to endure? You endure through something. Endurance is in the midstness. You don't endure alone. You don't you don't have endurance as just like like I have brown hair. You have endurance because you endure something. So endurance means getting through it. Netzach is get through itiveness. Expansion beyond oneself, right? Drawing on your deepest resources to expand, to persist, charging at and exceeding the limits. Netzach is self transcendence. I want to make a claim for Netzach as encountering limits. But not letting, but not giving in to them. Again, Netzach is one node. It is the expansive, right side, positive aspect of this. Next week, we're going to talk about a more irenic, humble model of Aaron Cohen. You know, loves peace and pursues peace. This, in a sense, is the anti-self-care sphere. <laughs> And I want to make a strong claim for it because I think, especially, you know, I'm going to be a bit flamboyant in this class, but like, especially since I think right now a lot of the bromides, right, that are kind of cast about is, is what it means to give in to something, to give yourself permission for something, to say, oh, you know what, uh, I couldn't do anything but that. Netzach, I think, is a, is, is a, is a, is a, is a kick in the tush. Netzach is a, is a goad in, in our soft part that says, actually, there's something in you that's more than this. There's something in you that can that can that can confront this and can endure this. And I think that this is a really important energy that again, we should it, it, this is not a source for guilt in which like let's say we're not in, always in a Netzach place, but it needs to be a resource we have. It needs to be an aspect of Kodesh Baruch Hu and of our souls that we have available to us because it is true as well. Sometimes it is true to accept limits and to focus on limitation and the like. Here and I think especially at this moment, especially when we are, I think, confronting our own limits in so many ways, how do we confront them and exceed them? Now, again, this does not mean overarching or via, or transgressing someone else's limits. Chas v'shalom, that's, that's sinful activity. That's sitra achra activity. But what does it mean to encounter your own limits, to endure yourself, to draw on God's, God's victoriousness. What does it mean to win? Can we win? Can we go, can we go to sleep exhausted and satisfied? That's the, that's, that's the energy I want to try to make a, uh, a case for tonight. Again, not as the end all be all answer. This is the beautiful thing about Spheros as a system. It's a system. All of these are faculties and aspects that we have the opportunity to draw on. So this is my pay in to Netzach. All right, so here's Tomer Devara, which I mentioned before, the Ramak's um, Book of Musr, in which he talks about what it means to try to model yourself after God. He says the fifth, the fifth what? All right. So the first part of Tomer Devora, I said, is all about Keter. It's all about the first Sphira. It's all about the, and he draws on the 13 aspects of mercy, of compassion, but not the ones that you know from uh, Kisisa, from, from Shmos, that Moshe says, no, it's the ones from Micha. And it starts, Mikel Kamocha. 
whole different set of the 13 attributes. Um, but it's also 13, also has to do with compassion. Um, and it is associated with Kesser, the uppermost Sphira, who is ultimately actually entirely compassion and love um, and will, desire. Um, but he says the fifth of these 13 attributes of compassion from Micha. That's the fifth. He says the fifth. But interesting, also, fifth is also, can be associated with Netzah. Uh, no, fourth associated with Netzah. Never mind, it doesn't work. Okay, point is, the fifth of these principles in Kesser. He says, Lo hechzik l'ad apo. Again, that is a quote from Micha. He says, God does not hold on to God's fury forever. We're gonna, I want to put a pin in this because it will be a, God willing, it will be a class I teach. I love Tomer Devorah so much, especially the first part of it. It's an incredible text. Uh, one of the other aspects of God is quoted as Sobel Elbone, God uh, bears insult. Um, it, it, lots of Netzach, I think, lots of real Netzach energy happening in here. So, Zo Mida Acheres, Afilu Shadna Machsik Bechet, Ein Akash Baruch Hu Machsik Af. So, this is drawing, I think, on the same point that Rashi was making above. That even if a person, I mean, it's actually a more radical point, because what was happening in the Rashi, David is a Balchuva. Right? David is owning his mistake. He's saying, I'm sorry, I screwed up. I'll do better. Do better. Right? But here it's saying, even if a person is seizing, right, is in the is in the thick of sin, God does not seize on anger. That's God. Pretty cool. God's pretty cool. Um, bold thing to say, but uh, I don't know, go to the exact example, but it says, and even if God does, like, let's say, have a momentary angry response, let's say, it is not definitive, it is not something that defines how God is going to behave vis a vis you. It's pedagogical, it's targeted, whatever it is. God is not defined by or does not glory in af, in anger, right? It's worth noting, right? Gevura, which is the sphere of judgment, is most commonly in the Kabbalistic theory, the theoretical system, the nexus point, the meeting point out of which springs Sitra Akra, because it's so easy for you to turn that judgment knob a little bit too far and it becomes wrath. Right? And once you get to wrath, as we know from the Talmud, people who are angry drive God from this world. Right? Anger is idolatry, it says in the Gemara. So that's the Sitra Akra, right? To be angry is actually to worship the demonic side. To be angry is to be demonic. Uh, again, it doesn't mean to have a flash of anger, although, you know, ideally we shouldn't do that either, but it means to be like a person who is wrathful, a cruel person. That's demonic. The machzik lo levatel kaso, God nullifies God's anger, afilu shelo yashuva adam, even if a person doesn't do tshuva. Fascinating. And again, this isn't just God. The full premise of Tomer Devorah is, this is us too. This is what we can be. You can be like this. What can you be like? Radically accepting. Radically enduring. I'm rubber, you're glue. <laughs> right? Whatever you sin to me, it does, in a sense, bounce off of me and really stick to you in the sense that it's not really about me, right? Someone sins, it hurts them. No, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt you as well. Okay, this is not the, this is not denying that people get hurt. This is a narrative of empowerment in which you can stick to and you can locate and draw on this enduring goodness in you that that survives whatever they're throwing at you. That's Netzach. You are not defined by what they're doing, by what they're saying, by what they think, by what they try. There's something in you that they can't touch and they can't know. 
that's essentially good and divine. God, and I, again, here we have God manifesting power in a radical way, not as punishment, but as acceptance. Sitting like this, accepting it all, bearing it all. It's not an invitation to punishment, and it is not in any way, shape, or form uh, encouraging people to misbehave or to follow inappropriate choices, but is rather a strategy of empowerment for oneself, one that's not empowerment over anyone else, but rather empowerment within oneself to recenter who defines you. It's not them. It's not your conditions. It's in you. Even if they don't do tshuva, you still get to determine, you still get to decide how you feel. Again, not everyone feels this all the time. Not everyone accesses this all the time. God, I wish. I wish nothing hurt me. I wish nothing sucked. That'd be great. But there is something inside of us that's pure will. And we can decide. It can always start here, how we react, how we respond, how we confront, or choose not to. I don't think this, again, this isn't advocating, I think, also for, like, um, detachment, or I don't think, it's, it's radical acceptance, but not radical detachment. Um, there is a way to be, this is, I think, is also a gesture of love, because people will do all kinds of things. And again, tshuva, and Netzach, Nitzachun, is being able to contain it all. Netzach, again, is a right side sphera, but draws on the left energy. It is an expansiveness that can contain everything. An expansiveness that contains it all. It's the universe. It's the cosmos. It's your soul. Okay. So that is drawing on the most radical, most lofty aspect of God as an example of Netzach, of endurance despite beyond what's getting thrown at us. It's a challenge, but it's a challenge that empowers to not be defined by what we encounter, but to define it and to defy it, but not in a way that keeps you attached to it or keeps you enmeshed in it, but in a way that contains it. To respond to insult with love, to respond to sin with acceptance, that's magnanimity. That's containing it all. And again, every time you see this in Tomer Devor, it starts with something about God, and then Ramak says, Zoi mida ru'uya la adam. This mida, it's not just theoretical, it's not just about God, it's not just theological, it's also anthropological. It's also about you and your soul, your neshama, what you can be. Zo mida ru'uya la adam li ba. This is, a, this is a, a, a trait, a characteristic that is a fitting, appropriate for a person to behave there by it to embody it, it's a, it's a reflexive verb, to conduct oneself with it. Al Javero, with one's companion, with one's friend, with one's partner, with one's acquaintance, with one's cubicle mate, whatever it is. Afilu shehu rashray lehochiach bisuri meschavero. Even if you, even if you asked all of your, you, you text the group chat and you're like, look at what this jerk said to me. Don't I have the license to lash out at them? And they'll all be like, yeah, burn them. Burn them with fire. They deserve it. Even if you have full licensure to upbraid them, to critique them, criticize them. Um, what's the word? To to. to the word, what's the weird English word that's always used for tochacha? Rebuke them, right? With, uh, with punishment and yisurin to make them suffer. You're bordering on cruel, right? You're bordering on that licensure, that license for wrath. But you're justified, 
right? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. They shouldn't have messed with the king. You know, like they're you know to to give as give give good as it gets to one's friend or their children. You know, just to take their whole household down, and to make them suffer too. Lo mimneze yarbe tochachto. Whoopsies. It's not because of this that you're going to be uh, increasing, magnifying one's tochacha, one's rebuke. Lo yachzikaso afilu shikaso el el ifatlenu. Don't give yourself permission to 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 buy into this, to get sucked into it. It's not good for you, right? So this is the point. It is not it is not defiance by opposition. It is defiance through circumvention. It's not evasion. Containment. You are not justified in this. It is not good for you to buy into your wrath and to rebuke them. Like, oh, listen, I'm helping them. I'm going to help them. Yeah. And Nancy says, love in spite of all reasons not to. I think, I, think there's, I think there's the other side of this, and I think there's the self side of this. We'll, we'll touch on both. But just like God, yivat lenu vlo yachsik that's lot of uh, that's very interesting because it can mean continuing on it can also mean any more anger yivatlenu right cancel it this is this is cancel culture cancel your anger cancel your wrath nullify it. um you know it's like it's like um you know it's like a sine and a cosine right nullify each other right if you have a sine wave and a cosine wave right they're complementary so in that way they actually neutralize each other can you bring love to hate? Can you bring acceptance to rejection? I think often the case, right, when people are acting out in this kind of way, when people are bringing anger, hatred, judgment, whatever, something's happening inside of them, often, right? And actually, if we're able to buy into our own enduring goodness and say, whatever they're doing, <laughs> I mean, listen, in this case, I'm not talking about, like, let's say you have, like, a real substantive struggle and, like, you're having something between the two of you. That's something that's happening between the two of you. I mean, here we're talking about you are encountering challenge. You are encountering negativity. You are encountering toxicity, whatever it is. Right? Can you actually realize, can you bring an expansive spirit to that, an expansive, generous spirit, and say, you're hurting? You could say, you're hurting me. But could you also just as well say, you are hurting? I'm not saying, again, that, you know, if one is hurting, if one is in pain, please, please, please seek out resources for comfort, for support, for love. But this is also saying, don't seek out resources to, um, to, uh, to, to support you in your quest for vengeance. Um, because ultimately, right, so here's the, here's the self part of it, right, that's actually going to taint you too, right, to be enmeshed in this kind of tit-for-tat struggle makes you now the aggressor, right, first they aggressed, and now you have license to aggress back, I'm gonna get them, they'll never mess with me again, right, and there's the other side of it too, in the sense of like, whatever is happening inside of them, whatever's encouraging them to lash out at you, something's happening inside of them. And that can be responded to either with anger or with love, with acceptance. So, again, it's a challenge. And, and again, I, I want to be very clear in what my, this prescription is. This is not a prescription I would offer universally. Every one of these things is a resource that we work on to be able to draw on when appropriate. If you do not feel capable of doing that, that's, that's, then you're in a different sphere at that moment. But this is what it means to do, in a sense, spiritual calisthenics. Can we work on the muscle of Netzach, that leg? Can we do leg lifts, but only with that right leg? To get that right leg strong enough to help us stand no matter how many blows we take. That's a resource that everyone needs, I think. I think we're often cornered into this narrative in which like what you need is actually a grievance. What you need is justified claims. But that actually locks you into a certain narrative of disempowerment, a narrative of 
continually having to be on your on your heels, back wheeling. Here, actually, you take the initiative. You define what we're talking about. Yeah, it was Lauren saying this is a model of resilience. Even though I talk, I use resilience to refer to gvura. That's why I'm using the word endurance here. Right, that you're enduring it. It's you're bigger than this. You are better than this. And what you can respond to with that is not superiority, but rather expansiveness. Can you contain it all? At moments, I think you can. Yeah, Susie. Isn't there sort of a negative aspect of enduring something? Like sometimes you endure things for too long or too much or right. like things for that sure. you shouldn't be trying to endure. Like. Yeah, that's and that's the question, actually, too. I, I would love to hear uh, mm -hmm. a little bit about that as well, I guess, about drawing boundaries, I suppose. Um, how far is too far? Is there such a region? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think, yeah, I think I think Susie and Eugene are, are bringing up an important dynamic or dialect that we talk about here. So I think, right, one thing is like, are you always reacting to something, right? You're endure, you're just in the midst of it, you're simmering in the soup of it, right? And the point of it is that's just like one foot after another. That's true. And that's why actually the next text we're going to look at is victory. Because Netzach actually Nitzachon means victory, victoriousness. So it is not just, I think, just getting through it. I think the point of endurance here is rather that like every victory, like every victory is temporary, right? It's not, there's no such thing as an eternal victory except in God, right? In our, in our spirit. That's where victory really is. But like, let's say we are victorious, but then something else knocks us down, right? It says in the, about the tzaddikim is a big, very common theme in chassidus that, right? You know, like a tzaddikim rises and falls, you know, you knock down a tzaddik seven times, you knock down a tzaddik and rises seven times. But that's what it means, right? You're always going to get knocked down. You're, but point of netzach is you, you're always going to get back up. Or you have this resource to get back up again. Okay. Um, was that... Um, I get knocked down? Is that, is that, yeah, okay. All right. Um, so... I think, so I find, no, I find this... A, I think the word I, I would use for this is like, I feel... Entered, I feel charged, I feel inspired by this because it's not descriptive, it's evocative, right? It's not how you're always, I mean, when you're at your lowest, when you feel bottomed out, when you feel like your, your tank is empty, it doesn't feel like this. But can you remember that it's possible? Remember that it's true despite your experience and draw on it and win. <laughs> But can you win on your own terms? Can you win on the terms of virtue? Can you win on the terms of magnanimity? That's Netzach. It's not, again, conquering another. It's actually manifesting a victory that is unconditional because it's not dependent on defeating anyone. It's dependent on establishing oneself. Okay. So here's the Orchos Tzadikim. The Orchos Tzadikim is a uh, middle, middle ages, like I think 13th, 1300s, maybe early 1400s, anonymously composed Musser book. Very popular, lots of printings, but as far as I know, I don't think we still, I don't think we know who wrote it. And it's, it's not, and it's not, a, it's not, it's not Kabbalistic, but it is um, drawing from this like moral ethical tradition that's called Musser. But I wanted to bring this in because it brings in, I think, again, a theory of struggle that I think is quite important. Um, and it's a struggle against yourself, like within yourself. But it's not a struggle. Again, I want to, I want to, I want to give a different kind of view of this. So this kind of Musr perspective is very common. Again, you find it in Mikhtav Meliyahu. You find it in all kinds of different Musr shivas, Musr books, and the like. It's all about battling the Yetzir Hora, right? You're battling the evil urge. And I think that there's a narrative around that, um, that the result of that is actually a, a self-demonization, right? That there's something inside of you that's bad and you need to fight it all the time and you're always at risk and you're always on the cusp of, 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 of great tragedy, right? I don't personally recommend that kind of narrative or that kind of framework unless i think you're somebody who it works for 
right? If you're somebody who gets off on that fight, great, fine, I guess. But I think I think I think I think can be easily become twisted into a certain kind of self-loathing or a certain kind of even, you know, I've seen people take it in direction of self-abuse and things like that. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, so I'm cautious around this type of thing. But again, this is the nuts up. We're buying fully into this, like, life is a struggle, but I can, but I can win. And I think that's an element that's missing from the Itzahara narrative, that you can win. We need to, I think, learn how to savor our victories versus being, being scared that there's a fight. That's, I think, one thing I'm worried about kind of totally withdrawing from this, let's say, more oppositional the theological narrative. Right, of which, like, no, there is a struggle in what it means to in what it means to be alive. That is, that is true, and we need to learn, I think, how to how to win. Sorry, we need to learn how to struggle with resilience, right? Resiliently, enduringly, but in a way that supports our endurance, that supports our resilience, and also we learn how to savor our victories, because that's what's missing. Like the whole doom and gloom Musser narrative never has room for you to actually feel justly proud of yourself. Not prideful, but proud. The difference between pridefulness and proudness is, is, is wide. How do we have a healthy sense of pride in ourselves? Not proud because we're so great, but proud because there's something in us that is good. There's something in us we achieved. Right? That catharsis is something I want to argue for as well. So we have the enduring struggle but it's punctuated with catharsis. It's punctuated with, with wins, with victories. Netzach is taking the W, right? You gotta take that W. A W is so great, it will carry you, right? You can, we can win. We can get through this. There is something on the other side of this. Yetzar Hara can be defeated. Death will be consumed. God wins. Life wins. Your soul wins. You can win. It's an important thing to remember, especially when it feels like you're taking the L, right? When it feels like things are set against you. So he says, therefore, he said, this is a powerful metaphor. It's a very powerful metaphor. Um, Actually, you know, I want to skip the Orchus Tzadikim. Apologies for for mentioning it, but I, I think we're short on time. I want to actually go to the Tanya. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so actually, Eugene, to that point, we're going to see. So this is actually the first time I think we're... No, this is the second time we're looking at the Tanya. For the first time we're looking at, like, the first book of the Tanya, though, the real Tanya. So this is the first time we're really doing the Tanya in depth. So the Tanya is the very important, famous book by Rabbi Shneir Zalman Liadi, uh, the, the Alter Rebbe of Chabad, the Old Rabbi of Chabad. Um, right, so here I just wanted to, or close to is one thing is that the evil desire always lies in ambush for you, right? Like, again, that's like the trap narrative, right? It's always lying in wait. But what do you do with that? I think more, I think more to the point for this is everything is lying in wait for you, right? You get up in the morning and you feel the doldrums, right? You feel the yawning gap. You feel what you're temp the things that you are tempted to do, which do not serve you. What do you do? So the alt so the first book of the first part of Tanya is called the the book of intermediate people, Sefer Habenonim, and that's who Chassidus is directed. That's who Chabad is directed to, not to the tzaddikim. They don't need your help, not to the Rishoyim Arurim, not to the to the cursed wicked ones. They're too far gone. But to a normal person. As someone who is struggling every day, right? The Benoni says Rambam is somebody who's 50-50, and the littlest thing they do can tip the balance. What does it mean to look at everything we do as potentially life-defining, world-changing? Powerful image. It says, Kigon da, sarich lo da klal gado. There's a big claw I gotta talk about. Kemosh nitzachon le natsach davar gashmi. I'm gonna use a metaphor of victory, enduring victory, in interpersonal material matters. Like two people who are fighting, fighting each other, struggling with each other, to defeat one another. They're fighting to win. 
הנה אם האחד הוא באצלס וכבדס ינוצח בקל ויפול גם אם הוא גיבור יוסר מחברו. If someone is in the fight is slothful, lead footed, right? Just kind of not really being, um, not, not, not energetic. They will be easily defeated, even though they are stronger than the other person. So what's really the quality that wins the fight? Right, if anyone's like an MMA fan here or a boxing fan here, right? What's really the quality? It's not necessarily, I mean, listen, you shouldn't fight in a different weight class, right? If someone's like 200 pounds, somebody's like 150 pounds, you will be destroyed. But what's the quality here? Think of like the scrapper, right? Somebody who gives it their all. That's what victory lies in. It's not in some objective quality. It's not some objective quality. I'm, I can, I can bench press 155 pounds. Good for you. But do you know how to infuse yourself with energy? Do you know how to give yourself over? Do you know how to devote yourself? Do you know how to, do, like everything, it's really about Mesira Sinefesh. It's really about, do you know how to give yourself? Throw yourself into it. Just like this point he's saying is that you can be super powerful, but unless you are energetic, right? Unless you give yourself into it, there's no way you can win. With your struggle against these things inside of you that don't serve you, your Yetzirhara, it is impossible to defeat the Yetzirhara if you are doing it with laziness, right? With slothfulness, with lead-footedness, which is a lackadaisical attitude. If you're letting it beat you, you can't beat it. If you are indolent, you can't win. Hanim Shachos, and where do these principles come from? They come from melancholy, depression, low energy. Tim Tum Halev Ke'evan, the dimming or the dulling of a heart that's been made like a stone. Anhedonia is how I would translate that, right? Not feeling in touch with the things that give life meaning. Feeling just gray, exhausted, done, right? I think these are things that a lot of people are feeling right now, you know, year plus into COVID, just what resources do we have? And I think this is a prescription for that. How do you respond to that? What does it mean to bring power back to yourself? The way to win is with zerizus, alacrity, eagerness, energeticism. Hanim shachas mi simcha v'sicha That stems from joy, authentic pleasure, an opening of the heart. V'tara so mi kol nidnu daiga v'etzev v'olam. And it's being cleansed from every niggling anxiety and, and trouble, right? It's toxicity, right, in the world. And this is incredible. Masha Kasuv, and like it says in Proverbs, the whole eight of Yia Musar, in every struggle, in every challenge, in every sorrow, there is also something that is burgeoning from it, that is freeing from it, that is profiting from it. Perush, this means, Sheyeh means that there's something good that can come from struggle, from challenge. But we should remember, But the struggle itself is not the benefit. And I think here's a really important point. A lot of people will say, oh, you're going through this, but you know, right? Like all challenges really are problematicities, right? All problems are really opportunities, right? It's saying, ah, no, the problem isn't real. It's really just an opportunity. The challenge isn't real. It's really just a potential benefit. No, says the Balatanya, and it's a very important point. The challenge itself is real. It hurts. You're hurting right now. That's real. It can be alchemized. It can be transformed. It can be catalyzed into something else. 
if we bring a different kind of relationship to it. That takes time, right? It's not going to be op it's not going to be automatic. It is a struggle to apply the struggle. The struggle is a struggle. That's what I was getting at before. The struggle is real as it, you know, hashtag the struggle is real. The struggle is real in the sense that to struggle is a struggle. It's not easy. It hurts. You're bottomed out. You're empty. You can't do it anymore. But you dig in deep and you find something. You find something that cannot be vanquished, that cannot be quenched. You find something inside of you that no one can take away, and you draw on that, and you crack your heart back open, and it flows. The challenge is real and is not the end because there's a next moment, there's a next breath, there's a decision you can make when you can, when you find yourself able to, you can conquer it. You can respond to it. You can vanquish it. You can do it. It takes a decision. And again, that decision can only come to us when we're ready. We have to draw on the resources we have. We have to draw on our friends' support. We have to do whatever we can do. But even that, right, even those are mini victories. Every decision we make to draw on the resources we have is netzach. That's the point. This, from the smallest texting a friend for help to the largest writing out a plan of attack, whatever it is, whatever little thing you do to contribute towards your expansiveness, your endurance, your win, that's Netzach. Every moment counts. Every moment contributes to it. Life is a series of steps. It's not just, that's the endurance. You're not just in the clear. You're walking the path. And are we walking a path towards our victory? Or are we defined by the quest, defined by the challenge. It's a question of perspective. Asimcha amitis b'ashem alokav, true joy is in God. Haba achar ha'etzef amiti, and that joy comes after the real authentic pain. Le'iti mizumanim, which happens at certain specific times. The Balatani is recognizing. Life hurts. There are challenging and painful periods of our lives. But they do not define us. It feels like they're unending, like Jeremiah, but they're not. They will end. They will attenuate. And you can take advantage of that and drive it. You find the resources in your spirit and in your heart, and you crack them open and let them flow. And how are they related? And here's a very powerful point. You recognize the bitterness you feel, the broken heartedness you feel. But it's through that broken heart is an explosion. The heart breaks open, explodes. It's through this breaking heart, this broken heart, this explosion. This heart that breaks open, that ends up dissolving, shattering, breaking down the spirit of toxicity, this ruach hatuma, the sitra achra, this demonic devilish side that keeps on trying to keep us down. And it's wall, iron wall that tries to divide us from God, but cannot because we shatter it. We break the wall down. It can't keep us from our truth. It can't keep us from the true joy that is in God. It's trying, and it is trying. There are things inside of us that want to hurt us. There are things in the world that don't always want our best. But there's something inside of us that is undefined by that, undefined by them, something that is enduring, something that we can gain access to, if we believe that it's still there. That's Netzach. 
I'll close with this line from the Talmud. It says, Come and see that God is not like a human being. Basar Vadam, a mortal flesh and blood creature. Minatschin oiso v'atsev. If a human being is defeated, they're crushed. They're, they're just destroyed. But God, Aval Kashbarhu, notzkin oso visameach. But when God is defeated, God rejoices. Shenemar, Vyomar Lashmidam, Lule Moshe Bechiro, Ahmad Bafer Slafana. Says, therefore he said that he would God would destroy them had not Moses, God's chosen one, stood before God in the breach to make God renege, as it were, on God's decision to destroy. God was defeated by Moses, who leapt into the breach, and God was thrilled by it. Why did I bring this up at the end of the class? Because it talks, it's the, this is the dialectic of Netzach. Netzach is in the struggle, but the struggle is life. Sometimes you win, that's the Netzach of victory. Sometimes you don't. That's the Netzach of struggle. They're both true. Because every time you win, you should savor it. But again, it's a win that's not over others. It's a win that's inside yourself. But when you are beset by that challenge, when you feel defeated, then you have a different opportunity of struggle. You have the challenge set before you of walking that path with courage and with endurance and with resilience to draw on that gevura as Netzach does to take one step after another and to not, not admit defeat, but to draw on something that is true inside of us, that cannot be touched and cannot be quenched, that can never be vanquished, that endures forever. Amen Lenetzach Boed. Um, thank you so much for joining the formal part of the class. I'm going to close the text study and, and, and end the recording in a moment, but um, we're not going to be having... Um, I think we'll still try to have the 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 Thursday night class, um, but I'm, I'm getting my... I'm getting my uh, I, I won't be able to do... I'll explain after, in the, after I close the video, but I won't be able to do Kabbalah Shabbat. Um, I'll explain why. But, um, but hopefully we'll still be able to do Havdalah at about 9.10, probably, 9.15. Um, and, um, and also I'll see you back here for, uh, for our next week of Sfirot HaOmer when we'll talk about Hod. But please, if you are IRL, if you're in real time, we'll still have some time to talk about this. And if you're not in this class, I hope you still find a chavrusa, a spiritual chavrusa, to talk about what these texts can mean for us and how to bring the energy of Netzach into our lives, especially in these especially challenging moments. I hope this has been helpful, and I wish you a wonderful week of victory. <laughs>